if you've ever studied music theory, you'll know that it's a lot. Um, the subject and, and topic of European music is incredibly deep and has a long, long history. Um, this particular way of looking at music through these particular scales and modes that are familiar, familiar to European music is perhaps what we are most familiar with here in the so-called Western world. But when we go outside of Europe to places like the Middle East, for example, we quickly discover that they have a parallel music tradition and one that is equally as deep and with equally as long of a history. Um, Arabic music and Persian music and to some degree also Hindustani music builds on traditions that goes back to at least the Middle Ages and even beyond. From the great philosophers of the Islamic Golden Age who laid some of the groundwork to figures in the Ottoman empires that build complex musical forms and theories, it's a fascinating topic. And one of the most, if not the most, important figure in the history of Middle Eastern and Persian music theory and practice is the 13th century composer and musicologist Safi Uddin al urmawi whose work on music would come to influence basically everyone else that followed him and who lived through some of the most dramatic events in the history of the world. His full name was Safi Adin Abdel Mu'min ibn Yusuf al Urmawi, and he was born around the year 1216, possibly in the city of Urmia, as his name suggests. His ethnic origin is unknown, but we know, according to his own biography, that he moved to Baghdad at a young age, a city that he would call home and which he would be associated with for the rest of his life. Indeed, another nisbah, or name, that he took on later was indeed Al-Baghdadi, which means the Baghdadian, or the, the one from Baghdad. This was, of course, a significant place at the time. Baghdad was the capital city and seat of government for the Abbasid Caliphate, which had ruled the Muslim world for centuries at that point. In many ways, it was kind of the center of the world in a cultural sense. And if you know your history, then you'll also know about the very dramatic events that's going to happen in the city a bit later on in the narrative of Urmawi's life. Safiuddin and his family seems to have been well off because he received a proper and comprehensive education. Um, he studied, of course, the standard religious sciences like the Quran and the Hadith, um, but he also formally studied Islamic law and Shafi'i law in particular, the Shafi'i school of law and Islamic law, and became an expert on that topic. Uh, he later also studied things like literature, the Arabic language, and calligraphy. In his autobiography, he tells us that he reached a, quote, unsurpassed degree in the field of calligraphy in particular. And indeed, it seems that Al-Urmawi first became primarily famous as a magnificent calligrapher, which was also likely his profession for the first part of his life. But aside from all these talents, he also had a clear interest in, and talent for, music. He had started playing and studying the oud, the Arabic lute, and became very proficient at it, although his talent seems to have been unnoticed at first. It wasn't until the Caliph al-Mustasim, the very last of the Abbasid Caliphs, ascended to the throne, that Safiuddin's life would change forever. His own account of how this happened is quite fascinating. Quote, There was a female singer in Baghdad known as Lihaz. She was very beautiful and sang well. The caliph loved her and rewarded her richly. He gave her numerous servants, slave girls, and possessions. It happened one day that she sang a nice, unusual tune to him. He asked her about it, and she said, This is by Safiuddin, the calligrapher. The caliph said, Let him come to me. I was brought to him, and I played the lute in his presence. From that moment, Al-Urmawi had won the favor of the caliph and joined his court as a celebrated musician. In general, Safiuddin was a boon companion of the ruler and they seemed to have been quite close. He was paid handsomely and would act as mediator between the caliph and other people. Having the opportunity to work as an official musician in the court of the caliph probably gave Urmawi the opportunity to practice his art even more, and indeed Urmawi is remembered as one of the greatest oud players and composers in history. But things were about to take a very dramatic turn. Because while Urmawi was at the height of his career, basically, he also witnessed firsthand one of the most major turning points in the history of the world, namely the invasion of the Mongol armies and the sacking of the city of Baghdad in the year 1258. 
the great Abbasid Caliphate, which had ruled, at least symbolically, major parts of the Islamic world since the mid-8th century, was crushed in one fell swoop. Urmawi's employer, the last Abbasid Caliph, was executed by the Mongols and the Middle East had changed forever. It's kind of incredible to think that this great and famous musician was a first-hand witness to this incredibly significant and brutal event. Luckily, he wasn't executed along with his boss. Instead, the fact that he was such a gifted and well-liked guy, he managed to charm the new Mongol rulers. His talents in music, calligraphy and other forms of high culture resulted in the Mongols taking a liking to him, and he could continue his career basically as before, only now under a new king, the famous Mongol leader Hulegu, and eventually the governor Allah ad-Din Atta al-Juwaini. Given what a dramatic event this must have been, you'd expect Urmawi to mention it or talk about it in his own account, in his biography, but in fact he barely mentions it. He very sort of just nonchalantly mentions that he got a new employer and in fact that the new Mongol leader actually paid him better than the old Abbasid Caliph did. For a more detailed account of the dramatic transition, we have to turn to another supposed autobiographical text, included in an anthology by Shihabuddin Ahmad ibn Fadlallah al-Umari. This version tells the story of how al-Urmawi charmed the Mongols with his music. Regardless of how true this account is, it really highlights the power of music in different ways. Safiuddin invites the Mongol commander to his house and offers him wine, food and music to charm him, basically so that he won't kill everyone and destroy the entire town, which the Mongols were kind of known for doing. He's eventually taken to Hulegu himself and impresses the Mongol Khan by making him fall asleep through his music. Quote, Then he, that is Hulegu, asked me, You were the caliph's singer. I answered, Yes, I was. He asked, what is the best thing you can do with your knowledge of music? I am able to sing, I replied, so that whoever listens to it falls asleep. Right, he said, sing to me now until I fall asleep. I regretted my words and said to myself, if I sing to him and he does not fall asleep, he will say I am a liar and he may even kill me. I must find a way to save myself. So I said, Lord, playing music on the lute strings only works well together with drinking wine. It would not be amiss if the Khan drank two or three cups so that the music will have the proper effect. Then he drank three large cups. When his face was flushed, I asked his permission and sang to him. I tuned the lute with the appropriate scale for the performance of tunes conducted to sleep, together with a sweet-sounding piping of the voice. I sang, and no sooner had I finished the noba than I saw that he had dozed off. This apparently impressed the Khan so much that Safiuddin had his favor from then on. Urmawi continued his role as a musician, composer, and music theorist under the Mongols, and indeed wrote some of his most significant works during this period. Eventually, just like all of us, he grew old and fell from grace for different reasons. In a kind of sad tone, he writes in his autobiography, quote, After the death of Allah ad din and the execution of Shams ad din my happy days came to an end, and my life, my income, and my comfortable living deteriorated, and I got into debt. I had children and grandchildren, I have grown old, and I am no longer able to work." Al-Urmawi passed away in 1294 while in prison for one such debt, a rather sad end for such an important figure. But he left behind a legacy and a list of writings that would cement his name as one of the most important in the history of music and music theory. As we've seen, Safiuddin al-Urmawi was considered one of the greatest musicians of his age. He was an excellent player of the oud, or lute, and had a sweet, beautiful voice. Not only this, but he had a vast knowledge of music in general, studying and writing about music theory in different ways. We could call him something like a musicologist who brought together and harmonized many aspects of music as it had developed up to that point in the region. It's even said that he invented two new musical instruments called the muzha and the murni. When he wasn't hanging out with the caliphs or playing music, he wrote books on music that would become incredibly influential. There are two books in particular that he is famous for. The Kitab al-Adwar, or Book of Musical Modes, basically, and a later work called the Risala al-Sharafiyya fil-Nisab al-Ta'alifiyya, something like the Treatise on the Art of Composing. 
In these works, Al Urmawi presents a significant study of music theory that systematized the maqam modal system and other features that had been developed by earlier philosophers into a unified system that became paradigmatic and a turning point in the history of Middle Eastern music. It's not like he invented this musical system, rather he was a very important systematizer that would define how that music was conceived and practiced afterwards. So just like when we talk about Islamic philosophy, we sometimes divide it into, uh, well, based on the philosopher Ibn Sina, who is seen as the greatest of the Islamic philosophers by many, and sometimes we talk about Islamic philosophy as pre-Ibn Sina versus post-Ibn Sina, because he is so important. And when it comes to Middle Eastern and Persian music, we can kind of talk about Urmawi in the same way, dividing it into a kind of pre-Urmawi versus post-Urmawi phase, because he was such an important turning point, um, and, and he defined how that whole musical tradition would play out after his influence. Arabic and Persian music already had a long history at this point, and Urmawi inherited a tradition that stretched back for centuries. Middle Eastern music is based on a system of modes called maqam, or maqamat in plural. Maqams are a complex thing that are significantly different from the Western concepts of scales, or even Western modes for that matter. Maqams are a certain collection of notes, just like a scale is, but also recurring phrases, associations with particular modes or circumstances in which they are relevant, and so on. And while they weren't necessarily called maqams from the beginning, the maqam system as we know it, at least in its earliest phases, dates back to the very earliest years of the Islamic civilization. In fact, the earliest writer on music and music theory from the Islamic world was the famous philosopher Al-Kindi. Already by this point, he writes about instruments like the oud, its tuning and construction, and the intervals of the different scales and modes that were used at the time. Slightly later, we also have thinkers like Al-Farabi, who wrote a seminal work on music called Kitab al-Musiqa al-Kabir, the Great Book of Music, which covered very broadly the world of music from practical and theoretical standpoints and was very influential, including on figures like Urmawi. Even Ibn Sina or Avicenna, perhaps the greatest of the Islamic philosophers, writes extensively about music in works like Ashifa. And the Ikhwan safa the Brethren of Purity, dedicated one of their 50 epistles to music in particular. These philosophers and musicians, of course, in turn based their ideas on earlier traditions, in particular the writings on music from ancient Greece and, of course, from ancient Persia. All these philosophers wrote about music from various different standpoints, not just the practical aspects of instruments, scales, and rhythm, but also more quote-unquote philosophical aspects such as how music relates to the universe as a whole and the divine order. Influenced, for example, by Pythagorean ideas, they discuss the music of the planetary spheres, how music reflects the elements of nature and the angelic and divine worlds. Although some of these figures, such as Ibn Sina, often rejected many of these cosmological aspects of music, this was still, for many others, an important aspect of the study of music, which was connected to many other sciences and, and aspects of philosophy, like mathematics and, and much else. It was sort of integrated as a very important aspect of higher education, basically. So this is the president that Safiuddin al-Urmawi works from. Everything that he writes in his books had been covered, at least to some degree, by earlier figures and philosophers too. The different maqams and modes had been written about to some degree in works like The Great Book of Music by Al-Farabi and in works by Ibn Sina. What makes Safiuddin al-Urmawi so significant is that he took all of these earlier developments and traditions and systematized them in a way that had never been done before, and through that he laid the foundation, a solid foundation, upon which all future music would be based. The scholar and musicologist Amnon Shiloa writes about Urmawi, quote, an eminent theorist as well as musician, he achieved a systematization of the general scale and the whole modal system that was probably in practical use long before his time. In the Kitab al-Adwar and in the Risalat al-Sharafiya, Urmawi provides an important summary of music in the region as it stood at the time. He describes instruments, how they are constructed and played. For example, Urmawi's oud has five strings rather than four, which was the norm in earlier centuries. And this was an important factor in making that number the standard for much of history later on. 
He also very significantly divides the octave into 17 intervals and describes and systematizes the maqams or scales slash modes that can be constructed using those intervals. If you know your music theory, you'll know that our western octave includes 12 notes, so Urmawi's system has five more. This is because his system, and Middle Eastern music in general, includes what is known as quarter tones, notes that are in between the half steps of western music. In fact, while the 17-step octave would become very influential, it would be extended even more later on with as much as 24 steps or 24 intervals per octave in, in other regions and places later on in history. As we saw from the fascinating story about Urmawi and the Mongol leader too, uh, modes or, or maqams were often, and still are, uh, especially back then, were often associated with certain emotions or that it had a certain effects. Uh, one maqam could be very good for making you fall asleep, another maqam could make you laugh, another one would make you cry, and so different maqams were played and used in different circumstances. They were only appropriate for certain uh, situations in certain environments or with a specific purpose in mind. This also brings us to another topic which is the medical use of music which was a, a, a large topic for many of these philosophers including Urmawi of course. The idea that music was used as a kind of therapy to, to help with both both physical and mental ailments and, and illnesses that people were afflicted with. Uh, different uh, musical maqams, modes, and different songs even, like different compositions, could be specifically aimed at alleviating a certain illness or alleviating a certain... Uh, someone being sad about a certain thing. Uh, here comes Urmawi perhaps with a perfect song to help that person with his illness or with his uh, whatever trouble he's going through in his life. In any case, the systematization and, and summary that Urmawi provides has become incredibly influential on the history of music in general. Another one of the most significant things about Safiuddin al-Urmawi and his writings is that it includes actual musical notations using numbers and letters, which is the first of its kind in history. Prior to Urmawi, all music in the Islamic world was transmitted orally and never written down. But with Urmawi, we actually get a kind of notation system. One that is very rudimentary, but still very, very significant. The notation system presented here by Urmawi never really caught on as such, but later commentators that were influenced by his thoughts, such as Qutbuddin al-Shirazi and Abdul Qadir al-Maraghi, would create their own spin on notation that eventually became widely used in the Ottoman world, for example. And that's really the point that we need to drive home the most. Urmawi's writings and systematization of music was very influential on the later developments of music in the Islamic world, from North Africa to Arabia, Persia, and even India. I just mentioned two of the earliest and most famous post-Urmawi musicians slash philosophers, Qutbuddin al-Shirazi and Abdul Qadir al-Maraghi, who built on his ideas. The latter figure in particular, al-Maraghi, became foundational for music in the Ottoman Empire, which would dominate the Middle East until the 20th century and thus play a major role in Arabic and Turkish music until today. Even as far as India, with people like the famous Sufi musician and poet Amir Khusro and later figures, we see how the writings of Urmawi are commented on and used as a basis for musical practice, thus playing a major role in the development of what we know as Hindustani music in northern India. Writing about the Kitab al-Adwar in particular, the eminent scholar and musicologist Owen Wright says, quote, There can be little doubt that the most influential of all Arabic treatises on music has been the Kitab al-Adwar. So as you can tell, Safiuddin al-Urmawi is definitely a key figure in the history of music. Not only was he a very significant and revered musician in his own time, being a leading musician in the courts of some of the most powerful men in the world, but his theoretical writings are some of the most influential in all of the Islamic world, and thus also kind of in all of the world in general. In all these ways, Safiuddin al-Urmawi truly shaped Middle Eastern music. I'll see you next time. <laughs>